Hello and welcome to the How To Carnivore podcast. I'm your host, Simon Lewis, and you're tuning into the Plant Free MD series with Dr. Anthony Chafee. Dr. Chafee is a surgeon, nutritional researcher, and former pro rugby player. He's been strict carnivore for three years and an on and off carnivore for more than 20. Dr. Chafee looks and feels like a real life superhero. If losing fat, building muscle, finding focus, and getting the most out of life is important to you, you're going to love the Plant Free MD series. Hey everyone, back with another episode of the How To Carnivore podcast and YouTube series. And we're with Anthony Chafee, the Plant Free MD again, who is fresh off the plane from the Philippines. Anthony, welcome home. Hey, thanks, man. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Uh, so fittingly, we're going to talk about travel in this episode. Uh, and I've got some questions for you uh, about, you know, strict carnivore traveling to Asia. I know there's a lot of meat there, but there's also a lot of other noodles, rice, mm. vegetables, seed oils, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so first question, man, what did you eat on the plane from Perth to the Philippines? Uh, yeah. Well, in this, in this case, I, I didn't, I didn't eat anything really. Um, you know, so sometimes when they, they'll, they'll obviously serve things that are, are mixed and you can request a vegetarian diet. Um, the only thing that's going to have meat is going to have a lot of other things with it, sauces and what have you, uh, that I don't really want. Um, so it, you know, I was, I was lucky enough on this one, you know, that, that they didn't even serve anything anyway. You could buy sandwiches, which I wasn't yeah. interested in, uh, but there wasn't really any meals to navigate, but you know, uh, normally when I travel, if we're given like a sandwich or breakfast roll or whatever, there'll be some meat in it. I'll just pick that out and maybe eat the pad of butter along with it. And uh, otherwise I just don't need anything, um, because it's, you know, it's, it's quite easy to not eat uh, for, you know, a period of time, even an extended period of time when you're on carnivore because you're not, you're not getting all these panic signals that you have to eat, you have to eat, you have to eat. My body sees it slept in, you know, it knows that I'm not going to starve to death. It knows that I'm not in any trouble. And so it just says, you know, can't eat, fine, no problem. Relax. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, once I get to, uh, so, you know, you know, the next airport, then that's fine. I can get something there. You know, when I was traveling from the U S to Australia, when I first moved here, mm. you know, I didn't, I, I left later in the evening. I didn't really have a big meal that day. And then, you know, I flew down to San Francisco. I got there overnight. And so none of the restaurants were open. And so I couldn't get like, you know, McDonald's patties or anything like that. And then it was like 14 and a half hours from San Francisco to Sydney. And so there was, there was a solid 36 hours that I didn't eat and just had like, a, you know, a piece of uh, ham and then a bit of butter uh, at each sort of meal and wasn't, but you know, whatever, it didn't really matter. And I was just drinking water. And then when I got to Sydney, I just sort of looked around and saw what was there. And I got like, I uh, went to a kebab shop and got, you know, they have like the meat box with, uh, with fries and chips. Yeah. I just said, can you just get rid of the fries and chips and just, and just fill it up with meat? The guy was so excited. He's like, you just want meat? And I was just like, yeah, yeah. Just, just meet up. He's like, yeah. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> you know, and um, he's like, "You want, do you want chicken or lamb?" I was like, "Can I get both?" He's like, "Yeah, you can get both." <laughs> like, Your best so, friend. So, yeah, he was just like, he just thought it was the coolest thing, and so I just had that. That was my first meal in Australia. It was this big box of meat, and and so that that's totally fine. So I didn't eat uh, anything on the plane uh, going up to Philippines this time, uh, and I, I quite often don't on planes. Mm. Yeah, I mean, eating that airplane food normally leaves you feeling pretty shit, even if you sort of like try and eat healthy or mainly meat because you're just sitting there, right? And you're in that kind of like stagnant air. It's, I think it makes, I think it makes sense for that to be like a, a semi fasting time. Yeah. And it's, uh, and that's, and that's the, the great thing too, you know, that I find with my work as well is that, you know, I don't, I don't need to eat you know, at, at set points during the day, I don't have to eat three, four times a day. I don't, I don't get into trouble if I don't even eat that whole day or night, if I'm stuck working or traveling, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I want to, you know, steak sounds good, but I, I don't need to, which is a very important distinction. Yeah. Serious freedom. Um, and then when you got to the Philippines, what, what sort of carnival delights are there, are there in the Philippines? Yeah, well, you know, basically everywhere you go, there's going to be some sort of meat option. I mean, I even even know people and work with people over in India, which is you know very big uh, vegetarian uh, vegetarian uh, sort of culture, but they're over lacto vegetarians. They generally do drink milk or cheeses, 
ghee and uh, and eat eggs and but then quite a lot of people eat meat even even the hindus so um you know there, there are going to be options available and it's just like in in any western country when you go to a restaurant you just need to ask not to put on sauces not to have the onions and the garlic and all the other seasonings put in with it and you just say can i just get the meat part of this so that, that's mostly what i did they have uh you know they, they sort of have different cultural tastes so they they eat a lot of pork there uh which i like you know it tastes good yeah. and so that that was a lot of it they have lechon which is like a, a whole roast pig yeah and wow. the, the skins like the whole thing's crisped up and uh and it's just it's just perfect it's so awesome. nice and uh and then they you know have goat as well which is another one beef is available but it's not as readily available as it would be like in western countries mm. so yeah yeah i imagine it wouldn't be the same quality of beef as we have here well actually it's it's a lot of it's what they import from australia all oh, right so That's yeah so a lot of yeah they'll get australian beef and new zealand lamb and so uh they'll they'll get that up there and then and then the local meats would be like pig and goat as yeah, well, and no. chicken you know yeah. yeah do you do you get around like the the mcdonald's patties when you're at at an airport or um sometimes yeah. there's boiled eggs at airports as well yeah quite often yeah that that's you that's quite often my go-to is the mcdonald's uh you know quarter pounder or angus beef patties because you can just order a stack of those and yeah. you're just getting you're just getting meat and you know something that, that not everyone knows you know the, a lot of the fast food places are, are vilified and you know some for you know uh well-deserved reasons but when when a lot of the you know plant-based vegan proponents say that oh it's actually really poor quality meat it's really horrible you know like kentucky fried chicken they call it kfc now because they can't legally call it kentucky fried chicken because they're not le they're not actually chickens they have those genetically freaks and they have like eight different legs and 13 wings such an exaggeration yeah well it's just a flat out lie is what it is and um you know you know kfc doesn't make their own chickens you know they buy them from people who produce chickens yeah you know they buy them from slaughterhouses and and farmers and you know in, in massive massive quantities and in fact i've spoken to people who who work in this industry and it's kentucky fried chicken you actually get the highest quality chicken because they are the biggest buyers of, of chicken they get they buy the most chicken at any given time and so they get they get the the lion's share they get the first choice and so they get the top quality chickens and that and that's what they get so it's actually very very high quality it's just you know, dunking it, you know, in a bunch of batter and then deep frying it in seed oil. That's where that's going that's to be where the problem. issue. Not, yeah. Yeah. The chicken itself is actually great. Um, but you know, the McDonald's, they say there's all these sort of problems that they actually don't actually support that with any, any real evidence and the, the quality of meat and the treatment of these animals is actually quite good. And so when I'm traveling, that's something that I consider because, you know, sometimes you go to, to different countries and, and maybe the, the way they treat animals is, is pretty piss poor and, uh, or even quite abhorrent. And so, you know, if you don't have, you know, in the West, we have a lot of laws that protect animals and rightly so, you know, you have, you have certain conditions, you have to keep them and care for them. And then when you, when you process them, there are certain things that you have to do to make that as humane as possible. Um, you know, there's, there's no nice way to kill something, but, you know, the ways that we have in the Western slaughterhouses with pneumatic hammer or, or electrocution are as close to instant as we have ever come. Mm. And it is, it is bang fast. And so there's no nice way to do it, but, you know, if it's going to be done, that's at least something that we can do is make it as clean and humane as possible, uh, which is what we do. Not all countries have that. And so you do have to be cognizant of that. One thing I like about McDonald's, and I've spoken to ranchers and farmers uh, in Ireland when I was living there who worked for McDonald's, and they were saying that McDonald's is extremely exacting. They don't, they don't just randomly source, oh, we'll get meat from this guy and flour from that guy and whatever from this guy. They hire farmers and ranchers to grow and raise the the livestock and the uh, and the crops that they want and raise them exactly the way they want grow them exactly the way they want in the exact same conditions and exact same way and they come and they check and make sure that this stuff is being done properly and so that they can get a consistent product so that a big mac in naples tastes exactly as the big mac in san francisco yep. as in 
uh, Sydney, as in Moscow, as in the Philippines. And that's because they are very, very careful about how they source these things. And so what does that mean? That means that at least those cows are being you know, cared for and treated in, in a similar fashion and regard that we would in the West and, and yeah, we'll so hopefully have a, a, the same sort of ethical standards as well. Like, like it might not be the best, but it's, at, least it's not, at least it's not the worst. And it's, um, it's, it's probably, as you're saying, like in some of these third world countries, it's, it's a step up. Treating them the McDonald's way is, is most likely a step up from, you know, other ways that they've been raised and slaughtered. Well, it could be, yeah, and you know, and, and a lot of in a lot of ways, you know, I've I've seen people, uh, you know, process these animals in in extremely humane ways. You know, generally, it's you know by cutting their throat, and that's that's halal, that's kosher, that's the you know traditionally that was saying like, hey, you know, this animal is giving its life so that you can live and your family can live. Treat this with respect, treat this with care, and and give it a clean, clean, uh, merciful death. Um, and that's, that's often what, what they do. And so a, a lot of people, sometimes they will, they will buy a goat and they will slaughter the goat themselves and, and prepare it the way they want it to be prepared. And, uh, so it's, it's, you know, so, you know, exactly what happened with that, with that animal and, uh, or with a pig and, um, but, uh, yeah, but if you, you don't sort of have access to that and you're worried about it, you know, McDonald's is, is a great, um, you know, it is a great option because yeah. you at least have some sort of sense that they're, they're treating these animals well. And it's actually, it's actually quite high quality. Mm. Yeah. It tastes pretty good too. Like you can get through, you can get through a stack of like eight burger patties mm -hmm. and um, yeah, you don't feel as shit as you do after like a Big Mac and chips, but no, definitely yeah. not. No. Yeah. And so, yeah, so a lot of that was that. And, and, you know, we, we cooked, you know, quite often ourselves and, you know, we were with, uh, I was visiting one of my, my best friends growing up and, um, you know, he's from America, but his mom's, uh, Filipino. So he, um, he goes over there to visit them because his parents retired in the Philippines. And so he was going over there and I, I met him up for that trip. And so we're hanging out with his parents who were absolutely you know, lovely people. And I haven't seen them in like 15 years. And so it was really nice to see them. And then I met a lot of his extended family, uncles and aunts, cousins as well. And so a lot of times we were, you know, beginning doing big group cooking events and, you know, the difference being that, you know, some of the dishes, they just left off the seasonings, you just had like salt. And so, you know, I was able to, uh, you know, just, just eat those things. And so a lot of that was, was that. And then when we went to restaurants, just ask for them to not put on stuff, you know, every now and then, you know, you're going to get a bit of sauce on something or a bit of seasonings in there. And, you know, I don't, it, you know, if it's, if it's not all that much and it's not happening that often, you know, I'll be, you know, fine. I'll just be like, okay, whatever, you know, it's not, it's not ideal. It's not going to, you know, I feel a bit, yeah, you know, yeah. off for, for the rest of the day, or, you know, maybe just, you know, a couple hours, but it's not the end of the world for me. Some people, it will be a, a much bigger deal and be a trigger. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it can be a trigger for something else, but it can also like, if they're healing from autoimmune issues, they could just be much more affected by that. You know, even like my hands, my hand, my, the joints and knuckles in my, in my right hand, much more stiff and just a little painful, uh, you know, now, and that's, you know, that I had some of this stuff that wasn't ideal and I've got a bit of, bit of aches and soreness that'll go away in a couple of days, you know, and when you're traveling, you know, maybe you don't have, uh, you know, as many options as you would at home. And so, you know, I don't get overly anal about it, Yeah. but you know, I, I do, I do try my best. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that's had a little bit of something in it. And so it's like, okay, whatever, you know, I just sort of got off as much sauce as possible, but maybe they had a marinade before they cooked it and they just didn't add extra sauce on it afterwards. And I just said, okay, just I'll have it without the sauce. Um, and so that's fine. Sometimes you have to do that when you're traveling, but uh, by and large, I was still able to get, you know, pretty much everything the way I wanted it, which was great. Mm. I mean, clearly the Filipinos prioritize meat. You know, you said they're really into their pork and, mm. and their chicken as well. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's often when you go to these, you go to other cultures, you realize that their most prized food is meat and animal products. Yeah. And it's, it's like a nice reminder that those foods are, you know, where it's at. Yeah. And sugar for the Philippines. Yeah. Like, really? Oh my God. Yeah. Well, like they so add sugar food. or like Coca-Cola? Everything. They add every, sugar to everything. I asked, I asked for some butter. I went to a, a wet market, which is just, you have a whole bunch of seafood 
uh, there's all fresh caught, or even, you know, some of the stuff that's in tanks, uh, you know, like, you know, lobsters, crayfish or what have you. And, you know, and that, and that's great. And she just sort of pick and choose what you want. And then they take that next door to a restaurant and the restaurant just could and you point on the menu, how you want them to prepare it. Pretty cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. And so, you know, I just had them, you know, sort of grill up most of it, um, or sort of fry it up. And I just said, you know, I don't want any seasonings. Uh, I just want butter on the side. Um, they brought this thing. It was like a toxic orange and I didn't know what the hell it was. It had a weird ass smell and they were just, they were just like, Oh yeah. you know, it's just like, uh, butter with some garlic. I'm like, garlic's not orange and, uh, and it doesn't glow. And, um, so I sort of like tried it and it was very, very sweet, and like, like, like syrupy sweet. And I didn't know what the hell it was. And so it sort of, sort of tried it. I'm like, that's not you know, just butter butter. and garlic. Yeah, Yeah, certainly. And I was, I was talking to my friend about it and he was like, yeah, you know, they add, they add sugar to everything. And, and quite often when they're making like a sauce, they will take like seven up and just like simmer it down and they just add a bunch of seven up to it. And just like, or or even just like the syrup, uh, seven up syrup. Wow. And just sort of like boil that in uh, just to, just to add to it. And it was, it was not good. That's for sure. And um, so I just, I just, you know, uh forego that um but yeah everything's covered in sugar they eat so much sugar there and you know the the diabetes and and um heart disease and blood pressure issues that you would expect from that are exactly what you find yeah Yeah, they're all there and you know weight issues and health issues abound in in the philippines which is not where you want them to to uh be prevalent because you know the healthcare system is very difficult there Mm -hmm. and um and uh, it, it's hard to navigate. It's, it's, um, there are some places where you can get sort of like, they're like free clinics, all the other ones you have to pay in advance and, pay in and advance. Pay cash. So you, so you need to, if you're sick, you turn up there with some cash. Yeah. yeah. And you have to buy your medicines. You have to buy your, uh, you know, the different equipment that they'll use. Like, you know, if you want, if you want to get injections or something like that, you better bring some damn needles or else, uh, or else a, they won't give it to you or B they'll reuse needles uh, from someone else. They will not give you a fresh needle. You have to, you have to buy and provide your, your own equipment. Um, you know, like surgical equipment, you know, anything that's, uh, you know, disposable or, you know, implantable, like you have to bring that, you know, they won't, they won't just keep that in stock. Like you have to bring it far out yeah and so you know if you can't pay for this stuff you're not getting you're not getting health care um there are some pre-clinics where you can you can go but um, most of the time you have to pay for it and because of that there's there's also some pretty dodgy practices as well where you'll see you know doctors saying oh yeah you know look you have some problems with your knee we'll get an MRI and like, oh yeah, because of this MRI, yeah, we really need to scope your knee and, you know, we'll have to put a camera in and we'll have to put this tool in. We'll have to, you know, clean this up and clean this cartilage or it can get really bad. You just got to make sure that that, you know, uh, that that gets cleaned up now. Um, and, uh, before this gets, gets any worse. And, you know, I was asked while I was there, they're like, Hey, you know, you're a doctor. Can you take a look at this stuff? And I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, uh, but I can read a damn MRI and, um, and, and at least read the results. And it, it said nothing about, you know, meniscus tear or cartilage tear or anything that would actually require surgery. Jeez. And certainly not that surgery. And so basically they were just going to make so this it's like person. A, it's, like an it's, like like a, it's like an upsell. It's like an upsell. It's like, oh yeah. Yeah, we yeah, can yeah. Get more out of you. We'll just make up some sort of symptom. Exactly. And, you know, um, so they just, uh, you know, so, you know, they're, they're going to subject someone to an unnecessary surgery just so they can, you know, get, you know, 3000 American out of them, which is a fortune over there. And, uh, and it's, it's pretty nasty when you do that to people that are, that are quite impoverished because, you know, the Philippines is extremely impoverished in some areas. Some of the people mm-hmm. there are extremely impoverished and we were there with my, my friend and his 14 year old son. And, you know, we were explaining to him, you know, you look around how these people are living, there was, there was a disparity. We talk about this, this wealth gap and disparities, like that's actually where these things exist or in, in countries uh, that have the level of corruption and, and lack of free markets where the bottom guy can actually make something and become uh, very successful and wealthy. Um, 
there are certain places that you are born into. If you were born into a certain family in these areas, that's where you're going to be. And it's going to be very, very, very difficult to drag your way out of that. Manny Pacquiao, one of the few, you yeah. know, and, um, and that fighting. Yeah, well, he did. And he looked at that and said, Hey, you know, I can earn money by fighting. I can help my family. Like, yeah, we'll do it because he was destitute. His family were destitute and they had been destitute generationally. And so he said, fine. Yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go fight. And he, you know, at 14 years old, he pretended to be 18 and went and you know, beat some dude's ass and, and, uh, you know, got some money and, and his family were able to, uh, you know, help, help, you know, help provide for his family a bit. That and he, that just went on. Now, obviously he's very, very successful. And he's when actually I, running for president. And uh, you're kidding. In yeah. 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 Oh he's running. What, what, what were people talking about Pacquiao over there? Were they like sort of with their signs and stuff like that? Um, I didn't see a bunch for like president or anything like that, but everyone talks about him. like the guy's a national hero. Absolutely. You know? Like absolutely. You know, they just absolutely love him, you know, and you know, someone to come up from, from very humble beginnings and, and be so successful that really gives a lot of inspiration to people. Um, and so you can, un it's understandably going to be a very popular figure in the Philippines. And, um, and, and it would, and because like you would see a house, there'd be a very normal or even very basic house in Australia or America, you know, like two, three bedrooms, something like that, maybe a second story and all around it and next to it are very, very dilapidated homes. Uh, you know, the actual shacks that are built out of, you know, corrugated steel and just slapped together with pieces of wood or pieces of steel that they've just fashioned together. And, and this is where people live and this is where entire families live. And you look around, this is, that's not the exception. That's, that's the majority of these people are living mm. in very, very humble, humble means. Mm. And, you know, we were talking to my friend's son and it was just like, you know, you look around, this is actually, you know, most people on earth, you know, live closer to this yeah. than they do in America yeah. uh, or Australia, we, we, you know, and it's, there, there are a lot of reasons for that um, and see the, the reality of that and understand that in the West, there are certain things that we do that actually, uh, that actually benefit, uh, you know, the, everybody's life much, much better. And, you know, some of these, these people that were living in these, you know, gorgeous houses as compared to everyone else, that would be a very, very median standard uh, in, in America or Australia. There was, um, Wow, there's this statistic from uh, Thomas Sowell that I read in one of his books that he got from another guy, mm. uh, from, a, from an economist down in, in Mexico, where um, the, the poverty class in America, like the, the lowest 20 percentile um, in America, that was equivalent to the you know, upper middle class standard of living in Mexico. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And, and, and equivalent to the median standard of living in Europe, hmm. right? All of Europe. So that includes Eastern Europe as well. So it's not just England or France, it's all of that combined. So the median uh, standard, uh, standard of living was equivalent to uh, you know, the lower 20th percentile in America. So hmm. you know, there are things that- Put things that, in perspective. Yeah, and, and it's so it's important to do that. And so you know, having traveled quite a lot, I've seen a lot of this. And so this is why you know, I, I you know, research, you know, study economics and people like Sowell and, and historians such as Victor Davis Hanson and, and many others, because you know, it's important to know about this stuff and important to know why things are very different in different areas. Because the, the, you know, as Thomas Sowell says, the, the basic fundamental starting point of humanity is poverty. You, you, you're born broke. You don't, you don't own a thing, you know? And you don't and know anything. You don't know anything. You don't own anything. And so, you know, it's, you know, people look at, say like, well, why are these countries poor? And what Thomas Sowell says, that's the, that's the wrong question. He says, why are certain countries wealthy? Why yeah. are certain people successful? Because the, the normal baseline is just to okay. do nothing and know nothing and produce nothing. Mm. Right. That's, that's, that's the baseline, you know, just, you sit still, you will be poor and homeless and, and uh, you know, not producing anything. So what are people doing differently that makes them successful?
more or less successful? What are, what are different countries doing that make them more or less successful? Mm. And so going around and seeing that puts these things in perspective. And then, you know, you don't have these, you know, these different sorts of cultural class clashes where you're saying, well, America's the most horrible place ever. Australia's the most horrible place ever. England's the most horrible place ever. And it's racist and it's sexist and it's this and it's that and all these, these terrible, terrible things, which no one you know, wants to be in. So we're very self-conscious of that. We just say, okay, you know, is there something going on here that needs to be fixed? And you, you try to address that. But when you actually see that things are so much better certain, and nothing's ever going to be perfect, you know, there's always room to improve. But when you go and see these areas that really do have serious disparities and serious poverty, you know, then you actually start putting these things in, in better perspective and go like, okay, there are flaws and there are things we can improve on but we don't need to scrap the entire system and start over. Yeah, that's right. Because there's often a call to kind of to overhaul things that, that might actually be the thing that's keeping us, you know, in the, in the Western mm-hmm. world, in a capitalist society in the first place. Uh, yeah. Because, yeah, if you try to interfere too much and make things too even, mm-hmm. well, you can see well, what you can make it happens even. In, uh, in countries yeah. like the Philippines. Yeah, well, you, you can make it even, but you're going to make it everyone evenly poor and destitute yeah yeah like you were saying um you know, previously tall tall poppy syndrome in uh in australia you know yeah. you just you want to, you want to make sure you know like you can even you can have all the trees in the forest be the same height if you if you cut down the tallest ones you know you just start lopping them off that's the only yeah, way things true. are going to be equal if if you're going to be free you will never have equality if you have want like like equal outcomes not not yeah, equality yeah. Opportunity. Uh, opportunity. equal opportunity is what we want yeah exactly you know, when, when you have equal opportunity, you will not have equal outcomes. You know, when you have equal outcomes, you will never have equal opportunity you, mm-hmm. by definition, because you have to stop people from, from Progress. producing yeah. when they could produce more, you know? Yeah. And so why is that a good thing? Why would you stop people from, from being productive? The whole point of, you know, being productive is that you're producing things that other people want and they're willing to mm-hmm. pay for, you know? So that's providing benefit by definition, you know, mm. and then obviously you get into, you know, areas of corruption and, and, you know, Philippines, America, Australia are no exemptions to this. There are no exemptions around the world, but when you get more corrupt, which the Philippines has a lot more corruption, then you're going to get into a lot more uh, difficulties. And in, in, in America and Australia as well, you're going to have different corporations or different special interests lobbying politicians to get special favors and to get special treatment and so then the government's picking winners and losers as opposed to letting people decide what they want to buy and what they want to do and how they want to live their life Mm -hmm. and that's when you get into problem but it's not it's not the system of freedom you know people's free choice to associate with who they want and to buy and produce what they want uh, as long as they're not causing any harm Um, the problem is corruption of that and, and forcing people down one path or another based on, on their own, uh, you know, own personal designs. That's the antithesis of a free market system. And you see that certainly in the Philippines and at different places in, in uh, Africa, where there's a lot of corruption, a lot of crime. They can't keep a hold of this stuff. And you know, they may not even care to because the people at the top will stay at the top. This is, this is positioning them up there. But you, know, you get people... Uh, like you know Bezos, uh, who is one of the wealthiest people who's ever lived, and he has more wealth than some countries, but he's also produced more than some countries he have produced. You know because you know he's got a, he's got a multinational uh, company called Amazon, and this provides a lot of benefit to a lot of people. And when you do that, you are going to be successful. Mm. Mm. And um, as you were sort of alluding to before with the Thomas Sowell comment, like, you know, if, if you want to make things even by sort of chopping someone down like Jeff Bezos, mm-hmm. yeah, the, uh, the outcome is not that we all go up to meet him on the billionaire stats. Right. The, the outcome is that somebody like Bezos comes crashing down to, a, you know, to our level or to a, a Filipino's level. You know, it's not... Tearing those people down doesn't make things, it might make things more equal, but it doesn't make, doesn't give you a better outcome. That's for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and it's only going to be certain people that are going to be equal because yeah. they're going to be people in charge that control everything. Yeah, and absolutely. They certainly aren't living equally. They yeah. certainly aren't living in the shanties. They certainly aren't subject to these rules. 
they are making their own rules and they are living mm. quite well at the expense of everyone else. Mm, mm. Yeah. And, that, and that's the grift, right? You know, because it's not that you're, you're trying to make things equal for everyone. It's just, you're trying to, you're trying to get a lot of power and yeah. you're trying to take away from people that produce and make that yours, you know, and then you're in control and you're in charge, but you know, but that's the thing too, is just like, you aren't the one who created it. You're not the one who's, who's able to run it and, and, and do it well. So you haven't earned it, so you don't know how to run it. Yeah. And so when they, when the governments take over these, these enterprises, they end up going pretty poorly. Um, and there's a bunch of corruption and embezzlement and other sorts of issues as well, which make, which makes them uh, go downhill as well. Mm-hmm. But, you know, but even in, in places like England, when they've socialized things and nationalized different uh, industries, um, it's just not as efficient because the people who have developed these things you know, aren't the ones in charge and, and running it and, and, and looking at this is like, okay, well, if I do this wrong, I go out of business, I lose my house and I lose my savings. Okay. But if the government just runs it into the ground and wastes a bunch of money, well, we just raise taxes. You know, we'll just take, you know, that, that, that's it. It's, I know, I know. The, 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 the politicians still get paid. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's, that's one thing that Thomas Sowell says is that, you know, it's a really bad idea to have people making decisions who pay no price for, you know, have no consequence for things going wrong, you know? So when you're making decisions in your life and things either go well and you benefit from that or they go poorly and you suffer from that, that really makes you look at things very, very closely. And totally. maybe it doesn't come out right, but wh- who's to say that some, you know, dude over in, in the Capitol uh, building is going to make a better decision than you, you know? I mean, that, that's just pretty arrogant. You know, that's just assuming that everyone's just so stupid, they can't run their own lives. Yeah. And so someone else needs to run it for them. Problem being is that when, if things go wrong, that dude in the Capitol house doesn't pay any pr- penalties for that. He's all good. He's fine. And, he his bonus. and the person, yeah. yeah. And the person who, who did uh, get affected by that, they're screwed, mm. you know? So they never even got a choice in how to run their life. They never even had the chance to do things uh, well or poorly because they were just considered to be so stupid and so, you know, sophomore that they couldn't make any decisions on their own. Hmm. So obviously, you know, okay, little Johnny, like, you know, that's cute that you want to play, you know, big boy, but here's how you actually have to do it. And then Johnny's life is screwed. And not only that is, and and what if it's, what if it's not screwed? What if he, you know, does provide benefit and, and whatever, well, he's now dependent. He can't actually function on his own. So how is that good? You know, you're not training people to be adults. You're training people to be dependents. You know, that's not good. That's not, no. that's not good for any society. And certainly not good for any, any individual. No. So looping, you know, it's it, a lot of harm. looping it back to nutrition, you think about like government dietary models um, yeah. or also, you know, like daddy Bill Gates making the decision that, you know, yeah. all the you know, fertile farmland should be used for pea protein and people should stop eating meat and um, stop expel- expelling carbon while he flies around on his jet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, why would you let somebody else make the decision for you on, you know, mm-hmm. on, on what is best for your health? Uh, and I think, you know, I think within the carnivore community, everyone's pretty aligned on that in that we're working out what suits us and what's, you know, and what we actually know to be true. Mm-hmm. and you, you got to back yourself right yeah well that, i mean that's the thing right is that you know this you know you, you can trot out any number of studies and you know there are ways of, of looking at studies to see if they're they're crap or not but either way you know not every any, anyway, not everyone can do that and you can get studies that say anything you know we were, we were talking you know off camera about you know, a study that, that, uh, um, people were discussing about canola oil and how, mm. you know, maybe it's, you know, uh, being vilified unfairly. Um, this study concluded that, well, actually, you know, when you put people on uh, canola oil and replace different oil, you, you know, who knows what else they're, e- they're eating and drinking and doing in their lives. You know, you, you don't know it's, these epidemiological, uh, studies aren't great just for that reason, but this, this thing, you know, showed that, you know, when you, we were eating more canola oil than other vegetable oils or plant oils, and even saturated fats that, you know, there, you, you, you improved your, um, cardiac risk factors, such as total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. So they're saying, well, this is actually good. Maybe canola oil is actually good for you and is providing benefit. But, you know, the, the salient point there is that, you know, those those aren't risk factors. No. 
So, you know, high, you know, reducing your cholesterol, reducing your LDL in multiple studies has been shown to actually increase heart disease, increase heart attack, increase stroke, increase cardiac related death. So that's not what we want. And so that's not an end result we want. And so that's not, that's not a, a, you know, something that I'm interested in. And, you know, when you have people, uh, you know, just, just, you know, talking about these and you can talk about all sorts of studies that, that say anything, but what is it doing for your life? You know, and, you know, why are you, you know, why would you trust your own eyes? Why would you trust your, would you trust your own body and your own health? You know, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, you know, and you stop eating vegetables and uh, vegetable oils and sugar and grains and just start eating meat and you stop having rheumatoid arthritis and that goes away clinically and radiographically. Um, no, 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 but that, but obviously that couldn't be happening. Because, Where's the study? You know, it's bad Where's, for it. Yeah, exactly. Where's the control Where's the study? study. Okay. Um, you know, uh, there are studies that show a lot of these things, but you know, at the end of the day, like, who cares? It gives a you shit. Know? Trust your instinct. Yeah, exactly. Do what works well, for you. well, but not even trust your instinct. Like trust the fact that your yeah. room is <laughs> gone. Yeah, yeah, you know, we, have, I have, I have so many people, uh, you know, coming to me, sending me messages about, you know, how thankful they are, how grateful they are that I've said these things because they have a Crohn's or ulcerative colitis and they they've gone on a carnivore diet and in two, three months it's gone, you know, and they get and this is not this is not subjective. This is objective. They're getting colonoscopies and they're getting biopsies of their tissue, and they're finding no signs of inflammation, no signs of Crohn's or UC. Okay, that is that is a hard fact. Mm-hmm. You know that it doesn't matter what your argument is. That's what matters. Is what is actually happening in the real world. And I, I say this a lot, but I will keep saying it because it's important. You know, like what uh, Richard Feynman said, it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is and it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. And so when you have someone with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and you say, no, 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 meat's really bad for you. Eat a bunch of plant-based crap and your Crohn's and ulcerative colitis gets worse. That's wrong. When you stop eating all that shit that they tell you to eat and you start eating the things that they tell you not to eat and it goes away, that's clearly correct. You know, and so at least something is happening. It may not be, you know, what I'm saying it is, but it's something, something is happening there. Something is going on there and it is helping these people. And when you have person after person, after person, after person, after person have the exact same results, you know, you really need to sit up and take, take notice because, you know, what a theory is only as good as what it's able to predict. And when I have someone who comes to me with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis or with Hashimoto's or with rheumatoid arthritis, and they say, well, is this going to help me? And I say, in, if you go strict meat and water in two to three months, you will not have your issue anymore. It will be gone. And they do it and it does. That works. Yeah. Every time, every damn time. I, t- I, mean, I, tell, you what, I tell you what, this has just got me thinking. Um, it's got me thinking about Rivera, which is uh, Sean Baker's company. Uh, and, and thinking about... I mean, how big of an impact could Rivero potentially make? And, and I know like you and I are big believers in it and, and we would like to think that, that it will help. You know, it's probably already helped. Let's, let's call it tens of thousands of people, maybe more. Yeah, who knows um, how many, yeah. But, but, you know, I hope it goes on to help tens and hundreds of millions of people mm-hmm. because yeah. it, it clearly can. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and, I, and I think it will. I think it will. I, yeah. I, will. I think it is. I mean, I mean, I... I, you know, believe in it enough that I invested my own money into it yeah. because I think that this is, this is, this is something that needs to happen. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not looking at this as an investor, like, Ooh, I think this is the wave of the future. I, I think it needs to be the wave of the future. If we're going to, if we're going to have any, any favorable outcome, yeah. because if, if medicine doesn't change what we're doing, people are going to be screwed and they're going to, well, people already are screwed. And they're just going to continue to get more screwed. If we have any hope of getting people well and actually living normal, functional, healthy lives, then, then we need to go to a model like Rivera, where it's actual preventative medicine, where you actually say, hey, let's address why you're sick, as opposed to just putting a Band-Aid on it and just pretending it's not there. You know, that doesn't work. You know, like if you're, if you, if you've got, you know, hit by a bus and you're bleeding internally and you're, you're crippled with pain. Yeah. You give someone morphine, but you also, you know, fix the internal bleeding. 
You know, you don't just go like, oh, are you in any pain anymore? No, I feel fine. Okay, job done, you know? And then you just let them bleed out on the table. You know, that that is not enough. You have to, you, you fine, you, maybe you, you help them symptomatically. You have people with uh, diabetes or heart disease and, and high blood pressure issues. Yeah, while you're healing them, while you're addressing the underlying issue, maybe there are medications that are gonna benefit them uh, until the underlying cause, root cause is addressed, but you need to be addressing the root cause. You don't just give someone, you know, blood pressure medication for the rest of their life. You know, you address their, Some people their do. and what they do, but you know what you, what you should be doing is addressing why that person has high blood pressure. And there yeah. are reasons for this. And there, there, there are some reversible reasons. And there are some that, that people think like, oh, well, this person just has blood pressure, high blood pressure. We don't know why. Well, actually we do know why now. And a lot of these cases is because of insulin resistance. And when you, um, you know, because insulin can affect the, the contractility of your, of your vessels. And so if that's not, you know, if that's not responding to insulin, that's not going to be uh, uh, going anywhere. And so that's just going to stay uh, rigid. And then that means pressure is going to go up because it can't expand and reduce the volume. So when you're not insulin resistant, you get rid of that insulin resistance now all of a sudden this can expand, contract appropriately and your blood pressure will be normal and it will normalize. And so you're not just, you know, you know, putting a patch on it and pretending that, that the leak's not there, you're actually fixing what's going on. And so I think that that's it, absolutely vital. I think that is medicine. Mm. Yeah, that's there we core. go. That's, that's a cool point. Yeah. That, and, that uh, is medicine actually, actually getting to the root cause and healing people, right? It's not yeah. just prescribing stuff. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, you do need to address these underlying conditions. And that's something we've just completely lost sight of mm -hmm. in the last 40 years of, of chronic disease is because, you know, we just didn't sort of know, oh, we're seeing more of these diseases. And then just people just dismiss that. And instead of saying, okay, what are we doing wrong? What are we doing differently here? They said, it's probably always mm -hmm. happening. And we just didn't notice it, which is so stupid. I mean, that is just, it's just, wrong you know we, we've been keeping very close statistics hey da, da vinci was an idiot, was an idiot yeah exactly you know that guy couldn't that could couldn't notice anybody with with coronary heart disease really you know that guy dissected hundreds and hundreds of people yeah you know, marcus right. aurelius all like you know you think about the incredible people in history nah, they were, yeah they were dumb yeah you know yeah you know michelangelo um <laughs> you know this guy you know was obviously contemporary of da vinci um these these guys they were you know had had permission from the from the church to do dissections because that was something they were like no that's you're, you're desecrating a body like that's not right uh, but they had permission to do that so they could see the underlying structures and the muscles and how things work together so that they could make better art and more accurate art and that was you know in the glory of God and and uh, and and in religion so they were given special dispensation to do that and this is when the doctors really started actually understanding what the hell was going on because before that you had your galenicals which were like the books from galen back it was in marcus aurelius's time um and he just wrote like you know this is the anatomy this is all the structures this is all this and this and this and this is how you treat all these problems and he said yeah and he was he was very uh evidence-based and and uh experimental in his approach but then he was he was quite uh profoundly arrogant when he said i have discovered everything there is to know about medicine you don't need to study this. You don't need to look into it. All you need to do is study me and then you'll know everything. Oh, Jerry. And, and so for like 1500 years, that's what it was. That's what Western medicine was. It was just, you know, learning and teaching Galen. Well, mate, we, we almost had that with the, uh, with the sugar lobbyists saying that fat causes heart disease. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You think about like if people didn't push back on that, it just gets set in yeah. stone for 300 years, however long. Well, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's still there. It's been it's, it's been still there, there. 50 damn years, and it's yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's not it's you still not get, with the struggle. But you, you know, you still yeah. get heart, heart, heart healthy canola oil and oh, yeah. low cholesterol. Well, it, well, it lowers your cholesterol, so obviously it's good for you, you know. And um, but yeah, what, what um, you know, some people found when they actually started doing these dissections was that Galen was wrong. That that these had these were these structures were actually only seen in apes and monkeys, and they all of a sudden realized shit, you know, Galen never actually dissected a human. And they started going through this. I'm like, these are all wrong, you know? And, and that, that was the thing, you know, so you, you have to do these dissections. And that's when, you know, uh, uh, sort of modern anatomical theory and knowledge actually came about. Um, Michelangelo was one of these guys. There is a, there is a uh, statue of this guy where he's like holding something and the pinky's just raised like this. And you look at my arm, you look right here. 
There's a muscle that only goes, with the pinky. it only flexes when you, when you extend your pinky. Okay. Not as, not as profound on my arm, but yeah, yeah I, I get you. And so, you know, that in his statue, his pinky was raised like that. That muscle was contracted. How's that for data? You know, that guy knew the body. These guys paid attention. And so if you're going to see a bunch of people with all these diseases that we had, they would have picked it up. Someone would have picked it up. And yet we're only seeing this now. And we're keeping close watch on this. We're keeping close statistics on it. And yet it's only popping up now. Well, were we just not paying attention before? No, we were paying close attention before. And then we just saw this spike up and people just, just ignored it. Just went, ah, I'm sure it's nothing. You know, that was wrong. You know, there was something going on. And, you know, I argue that it's, that it's diet, but it was something, something happened, something changed on a population wide uh, basis. And it wasn't our genetics, you know, because it, that doesn't happen. That can't happen in population genetics. Anybody who, you know, study population genetic would, genetics would know that is not possible to do without you know, massive eradication and mass genocide uh, of a population, you know, under very specific means, you know, like you isolate out a specific, you know, genetic group and you slaughter them. You know, that's the only time that you're going to get any, any significant changes uh, in any, you know, in any you know, period of time in a lifetime or a few generations, it just cannot happen otherwise. And so it didn't happen. So something happened. People were paying attention and we were paying attention and we noticed exactly when this happened. It started increasing and we, we saw it. We saw it happen in real time. And then everyone just went, ah, I'm sure it was always happening. Why? Yeah. Did we start, did we, were, were people, did we just massively overhaul our, our statistics, uh, you know, taking capacity? Is that, is that something we changed? No, it was exactly or were, the same. Or, or, or were humans sort of born to have half of us as sick as they are currently? Do you know what I mean? Like even that kind yeah. of logic of like, you know, should a human be crazy unhealthy and have heart disease at 60 years old? Well, hmm. no, and it doesn't make any sense because they're not, they can't function. They can't do anything. They're sick. Yeah. I think a, an interesting kind of question, I don't know if you've got an answer for this, but like historically, there must be some races who've kind of like run into a into a bad time um, and have been unhealthy. Like, for example, you know, people talk about the Egyptians eating a lot of wheat and then we've got like all these mummifications of the Egyptian people and a lot of them, you can tell they've got like arthritis and they had a lot of visceral fat. Um, have you got any kind of anecdotes of any cultures that that, that suffered similar to that? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we don't even have anecdotes. We have, we have hard evidence that that um, you know the, the ancient Egyptians did suffer specifically from eating wheat because yeah. you know, we have we have and, that, and they were a rich group of people, like relatively speaking. Relatively speaking, and then there were there were very wealthy pharaohs and nobility yeah. uh, there uh, within, and you know we we actually looked at these these mummies and and subjected them to to stable isotope testing. And actually found that because the thing is that people don't always know is that everybody was mummified by and large. Mo most people were mummified, not necessarily everyone, but it wasn't just the pharaohs. It wasn't just the wealthy and their servants that were mummified. Uh, it was basically everyone. Mm -hmm. And so uh, people have estimated that there are more mummies uh, buried around Egypt today than there are people alive in the country of Egypt. Yeah, so, wow. There are a ton of these things and we look at them and, you know, poor, middle, upper, lower class, um, they look at them and they found that they were all eating the same thing. They were all eating basically the same thing as, as, um, as found by the stable isotope uh, research. And they found that, you know, the poor people were eating wheat, the rich people were eating wheat. It's just, you know, the rich people probably had more of it and, uh, you know, didn't, didn't have to go hungry every now and then, but uh, everyone was eating the same thing and they were all getting the heart disease. They were all getting uh, excess adipose tissue. They were, the men were getting gynecomastia to the extent that their statues depict this, where you have men with man boobs and a gut, you know? And uh, when you look at the ancient Greeks, hey. statues were just, just ripped demigods. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, maybe that's just uh, you know artistic, you know, um, yeah, artistic license, or maybe it's not. License. But yeah, but you know, but it's it's interesting. And when you have when you have uh, you know these statues just showing man boobs, you know, when when a lot of people are probably starving, you know, so it's not just 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 
just excess food. It's, it's uh, you know, excess of the wrong food. Um, you know, there's also uh, early historical, you know, sort of um, archaeological, paleontolo paleontological uh, evidence where there was, a, there was a group of early humans before Homo habilis and before the Ice Ages that sort of split off and started eating more plants and more plants and more plants. Well, they died off. They don't exist anymore. They died off about 3 million years ago. So the, the group that sort of started going the way of the vegan, they died out. They didn't make it. And, uh, and ominous for contemporary vegans. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's not going to be good. And 3 million years ago, we were much closer to our herbivorous roots than yeah. we are today. And, you know, even, even early humans at that time had not gone full carnivore and the, the line that did go full carnivore, that's us, you know, that, that those are who we descended from. And so you'll see uh, there's a, there was a Harvard study as well, more recent, obviously more recently than that, um, that, uh, that looked at dental health in um, the Inuits living traditionally, not living in cities and eating much of nonsense, but actually eating um, uh, traditionally and just eating meat. And then they looked at that with a, with a group living rurally in the Yucatan uh, peninsula and they were eating a lot of you know plants you know they weren't eating processed food they weren't eating a bunch of sugar and crap they were eating plants in the forest by and large and they were eating meat as well because you can't you simply can't survive without meat in some extent but they were eating a lot of plants and you know the inuits not eating any plants and um this dentist that was doing this i don't know if he's a professor of dentistry uh at um you know over there or or just whoever was running the study but he said that in his entire career, he had maybe seen 10 perfect teeth. And in the Inuits they studied, every single one except two teeth were perfect. And they looked at you know, uh, quite a, you know, hundreds of individuals. So I think it was, it was close to a thousand different teeth. And he said that all but two of them were perfect. They didn't have dentists, they didn't have dental flaws, they weren't brushing their teeth, you know? and now they do lines in the Serengeti, and yet they have their teeth their whole lives you know, and we're losing our teeth, they're rotting, they're getting cavities, that should tell you something, your oral dental health, you know, should be able to take care of itself. Mm. You know? It's like, it's, it's like the canary in the coal mine, your teeth, I think, like, the, yeah. like, it's often the first thing to go wrong. You know, I've, I've conducted my own study on myself. And uh, I had trouble with my wisdom teeth coming through. Um, and ever since switching to, you know, 95% carnivore, uh, they're just coming through no problem. And like before that, I'd seen dentists and they're like, oh, you got to pay X amount of dollars to get them all cut out. You're going to have to be knocked out, blah, blah, blah. That is coming through now. Yeah. Um, and like before it was, they were getting infected and causing bad breath. And I just don't even think about them now. They're coming through. It's healthy. Hardly brush my teeth. I only really brush my teeth when I'm going somewhere, you know, somewhere nice, basically. You just, it's, it's so much easier and your mouth is so much healthier. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I still, you know, sort of brush and floss, you know, and, um, but I find that um, it's, uh, it's just a very different thing. Yeah, it's, it's much easier to, uh, to keep care of your dental, dental health and oral health. And, you know, that's something people ask me, you know, because like, there are sweeteners and there are, you know, mint and whatever flavors and toothpaste, is that something you want? Well, um, it may not be ideal, but uh, you're not going to swallow it. So it's not really going to get much into you. But um, there are dentists that say that you should probably just stick to, to baking soda, just something a bit coarse um, that you can sort of wet the toothbrush, dip it in that and you have a bit of stuff on the end and then you just use that as, as an abrasive mm. to sort of get off and try uh, that like build up. Yeah. And then, um, and then that, that works. And so, um, but you know, if you have to use toothpaste, it's not, I don't, I don't think it's, it's as big of a deal as, as uh, spinach or anything like that. So, you know, it's, um, it's something that um, uh, if you want to get as, as close to perfect as you can, then you know, baking soda is a good idea. But yeah, so the, you know, the, the Harvard study looked at these guys, they found that they had perfect damn teeth and, you know, and, and they contrasted that with this tribe in the Yucatan whose, whose teeth were just, it was like a chimpanzee at the zoo, mm. you know, who just gets Yellow, actually fed a bunch of, yeah, who gets fed a bunch of bananas and things because they don't eat that very often in the wild. You know, they eat, they eat specific leaves and plants. And so, you know, they, it was just like just rotting out of their teeth. They had very poor dental health. They had like, you know, smaller jaw size, crooked teeth, 
very poor quality teeth and they were rotting and getting, you know, cavities and, and falling out of their heads. And so this was, this was a stark contrast uh, in just a more recent study that was published in the, in the Harvard Crimson uh, a while ago. But, you know, there, there are countless examples. And then you have, you know, look at, look at different areas just around the world that, um, you know, like, like in China and, and other parts of Asia were very plant-based, very rice-based. They don't necessarily have a lot of access to meat because, you know, a lot of people are impoverished. They don't grow very tall. The average height of a population, you know, indicates the average health of a population. And you get these, you know, and obviously there've been, you know, communist famines and, and wars yeah, yeah. And, and times of strife. So, you know, people can genetically not develop small. properly. Yeah. Well, well, just developmentally, they're smaller, but genetically they could have grown bigger if given the right, uh, you know, the right nutrition. And so then you get these, you know, small wizened, uh, people, and then they come to America and their kids are six foot four, six foot five. Yeah. You know? it's pretty amazing. They're, actually, they're actually getting, you know, high quality just food. food, which is meat. And so, you know, you can just, you can just see that right there from one generation to the next, how much difference, uh, you know, proper nutrition makes. You have someone who's five foot four, their kids, six foot eight, you know, how'd that happen? You know, was, was it the milkman tall or something? No, because, <laughs> you know, they, they actually, uh, you know, actually were getting proper nutrition and they were able to develop to their genetic potential. Interesting. And so, yeah, you, you can see it just in, just, in, just, just right there every day, you know, from, from different, uh, you know, population migration as well. Yeah. Fascinating. All right. Well, we, uh, we started off on travel, went to the Philippines, mm -hmm. talked about Thomas Sowell and economics. Uh, good things. And then we started talking about dental health. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> oh, we even got, we got a little bit of Da Vinci in there too. And Michelangelo. Don't Michelangelo, mate, yeah. we went all over. Yeah. But um, yeah, to, to jump back to the, the beginning, um, you know, it is possible to, you know, eat any way that you want to anywhere in the world. And uh, there are ways Freedom. to do that conscientiously. And, um, and sometimes you, you make some, you know, mitigations, like there's a bit of sauce on it. Like, okay, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, be too much of a, of a, uh, having too much of a problem with that. But other times there were a lot of sauces and I just said, yeah, I'm not going to eat. And they're like, you're not going to eat anything. I was like, yeah, I'd, I'd rather not eat than, than eat something that's bad for me, you know? And, uh, and you can do that on carnivore because it, it doesn't really matter. Um, in, in the grand scheme of things, I could go a couple of weeks without eating and not run into any serious health issues. You know, I don't plan on doing that and I won't ever do that intentionally, but, you know, if I need to skip a meal or I need to not eat for a day until I get to something that I want to eat, you know, then, then I'm happy to do that. You know, if, you know, the only thing that I have to eat is a you know brick of heroin, I probably won't eat that, you know? And so I'll just say like, yeah, there's no food here. I'm not going to eat yet because I don't, I just don't consider those things food. You know, that's something that if I'm starving to death, I can get sustenance. I can, I can nourish myself to not die but I don't consider that food because food is species specific and our species, that's not food. And so I don't want to just get some nutrients for the sake of that. Like I'm not starving. I'm not in any pain. I'm not in any distress. So why would I subject myself to that? Why would I put something harmful in my body just for the sake of getting some calories? And I don't care. I have enough calories. I have fat reserves, you know, like they exist, even though, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, more lean than I've been at other times in my life. I still have plenty of, of fat reserves. Like I'm, I'm not in any trouble. And so not eating for a day or two or five is not going to cause harm. And so I can certainly skip, you know, one meal uh, in favor of, of waiting and to, to get something else. So it's never really a problem if you uh, just sort of, you know, it takes a bit of effort, but you know, life is effort, like, you know, and, and things that are worthwhile take effort. So um, you know, I'm, I'm willing to do that. And if other people are as well, there are things that you can do and, uh, and go all over the world without a problem. Great advice. Thanks, Anthony. All right, mate, we'll leave it there. Uh, cool. Sounds good. Let's chat again next week. Sounds good, buddy. See you then.